Yo, what's up guys? Alpha, and today I'm going to be doing a full in-depth deck breakdown of a deck that I've recently used to get top 40 with on the Arena Ladder. Uh, as you can see from the untapped screenshot, I'm currently 23-6 and six with the deck, so it's been performing really well for me. Uh, now before I get into it, there's going to be an MTGA Zone link down in the description. If you click on that, it'll have the full deck list there that you can just easily import into Arena if you want to try the deck out for yourself. And I'm also working on a, a full text article about this deck that'll have more detail, um, how some tips and tricks, a full sideboard guide, and how I would change the deck for best of one. So as soon as that's finished and up, I'll link that down in the description as well if you want a bit more detail on the deck. Uh, so, with that out of the way, this is my Red Black Sacrifice Goblins deck in Historic. And uh, Now, Goblins as an archetype has been around in Historic for a while, and the old school Goblins deck is probably the deck that I've played the most in Historic. It's one of my favourite decks, but I feel like that build of the deck has been massively power crept in the format and has two main weaknesses. First of all, it's really weak to removal itself and it also doesn't run that great interaction either and with the prominence of decks like Phoenix, Auras and Arcanist in the format right now I feel like you need to be running decent removal and decent interaction or you'll just get run over by those types of decks. Now the real strength of these Muxus based Goblins decks is that they attack on two fronts. So you've got your fair game plan of just casting your Goblins out normally and just doing whatever they do. And then the fact that you can run Muxus as well gives you access to kind of like a one card combo because if the opponent has a bunch of interaction to deal with your fair creatures, you can just use Muxus to completely swarm the board again and often win the same turn that you play it. Uh, and on the flip side, if the opponent has like thought seizes and counter spells to deal with your Muxus, you can often go under that just by casting your goblins and, and doing your fair game plan as well. So the fact that goblins has access to a fair game plan and sort of this one card combo through Muxus makes it very difficult to fight on two fronts if that makes sense. But like I said, I feel like the old school style of goblins decks that were trying to win with haste creatures with like Chieftain and Warchief with Krenko just doesn't cut it anymore. So I've been experimenting with other ideas and this deck built around sacrifice synergies has felt way better to me. So the real strength of this deck in particular is, first of all, it has way better interaction than the, the other goblins deck. Um, which means that it can keep up with the other decks in the format that are very proactive. Second of all, the deck itself is a lot less vulnerable to interaction. I'll, I'll explain a little bit why that in a, in a minute. Um, the, all of the individual cards in the deck are also just better quality and better individual cards, if that makes sense. And on top of that, there's also a lot more synergy between the combo pieces and between the cards in the deck anyway. So. Since we're not trying to win with haste creatures like the old builders with Chieftain and Warchief, how are we winning with this build? Well, it's kind of a combination of two things. We do get in for damage in combat whenever we can, just by attacking. But oftentimes the main way we're going to be winning with this deck is by draining the opponent out using either Sling Gang Lieutenant or Pashlik Mons. So Sling Gang Lieutenant, 4 mana 1-1, one, one. when it enters play we create 2 1-1 one, one tokens, so it essentially puts 3 bodies into play for 4 mana. And then we can sacrifice the goblin at no mana cost to drain the opponent out for one. So Sling Gang Lieutenant, you know, if we can get chip damage in throughout the course of the game and we have a big board, we can just sacrifice our whole board to just drain the opponent out. And that's often how we win. You know, we can get pretty wide boards, play the Sling Gang Lieutenant and drain the opponent out. Or we can win off Muxus by playing the Muxus, getting a bunch of goblins into play and then draining the opponent out using the Sling Gang Lieutenant. Uh, Pashlik Mons kind of works similarly. Uh, whenever Pashlik Mons or another Goblin we control dies, we deal 1 damage to any target. So the fact that we can deal damage to any target means that we can go face with this. So similar to Sling Gang Lieutenant, we can just drain the opponent out with Pashlik Mons. But the fact that this can target creatures and planeswalkers means it also works really effectively as creature removal as well. Um, and so if we have a big board with Sling Gang Lieutenant, we can often drain the opponent out. If we have a big board with Pashlik Mons and a sack outlet like Skirk Prospector, we can often drain the opponent out. But if we have Sling Gang Lieutenant and Pashlik Mons together, we deal so much damage because for every goblin we sacrifice to the Sling Gang Lieutenant to drain the opponent for one, we also get a trigger off the Pashlik Mons. So we're essentially dealing two damage for each of our goblins. So even if we have a completely empty board, if we play Muxus and get a hit of some goblins alongside Sling Gang Lieutenant and Pashlik Mons, that's often good enough just to win the game on the spot just by sacrificing all of our goblins and dealing a bunch of damage directly to the opponent. So that's the main difference between this build and the old build and this deck just feels a lot better at interacting and a lot more um, kind of it, it is better against the opponent's removal as well. Uh, so outside of the Sling Lieutenant and the Pashalik Mons, the other really good interaction that we've got in the deck is first of all Munitions Experts. This is 
two mana one one with flash, and when it enters the battlefield, we deal damage to a creature or planeswalkers equal to the number of goblins we control. So this is great because it's very scalable removal. We can play this on turn two to kill a one drop, and then once we have a decent number of goblins on the battlefield, we can just use it to kill really big creatures and really big planeswalkers. Um, and this is great because we can use it to kill bigger creatures in the format like Crackling Drake, Storming Entity. If we have a big board, we can often kill Aura's creatures as well, which is really important because one of the toughest matchups for the old school Goblins deck was Aura's because Mono Red doesn't really have great interaction because it's all damage based. Whereas even though Munitions Expert is damage based, it's calculated on the number of goblins we have in play and because we have stuff like Slingang Lieutenant that puts a bunch of goblins into play Munitions Expert can often d take down bigger creatures as well. Uh, one thing you do need to be aware of of this is that it is kind of vulnerable to interaction from the opponent's side so say against a Phoenix deck you flash this in on turn 2 to try and kill a Dragon's Rage Channeler the opponent cal can kill the Munitions Expert with the trigger on the stack and if you don't have any other goblins in play when the trigger resolves, it'll deal zero damage because you have zero goblins in play. So do be aware of that. But outside of that, this is just absolutely great interaction. And is also really good off Muxus itself as well. Because even if we can't get a winning Muxus, you know, if we if we don't get a Stingani Lieutenant or Pashling Mons to drain the opponent out, we can often just hit a bunch of goblins and a Munitions Expert and just kill the opponent's biggest threat, which can often just stabilise us anyway. So Munitions Expert, really, really great interaction. Uh, Pashlik Mons, like I said as well, is really nice interaction, uh, and it does pair particularly well with either the Southern Gang Lieutenant or also Skirk Prospector. So Prospector allows us to sacrifice goblins to produce mana, so we can sacrifice our board with the Prospector to, tr to create mana to either play other stuff, or we can pump that mana into Pashlik Mons' ability. So say for example we have a Prospector, Pashlik Mons, and four or five other goblins on the battlefield, we can just sacrifice those goblins and then pump the four mana that we create off the Prospector into the Pashlik Mons to sack another goblin to create two more and just keep going. And that can, you can often just drain the opponent out using Prospector in conjunction with Pashlik Mons as well. Uh, Slingang Lieutenant I've already talked about, that can work nicely as interaction with the Pashlik Mons. And the final piece of interaction that we've got here is Twinshot Sniper. So this is a new card from Kamigawa, and this is a really excellent addition to the Goblins deck. So, 4 mana, 2-3 reach, and when it enters the battlefield it deals 2 damage to any target. And we can channel it, which means pay 2 and discard it to also deal 2 damage to any target. So this is great as flexible removal, that we can deal 2 damage to a creature in the early game, which is great at taking stuff out like, you know, Aura's Creatures, Dragon's Rage Channeler, Llanowar Elves. You know, there's a bunch of cheap creatures that are really important to take out as soon as possible. And the channel ability on this is really nice because it means that the opponent can't interact with it in conventional ways. You know, it dodges regular counter spells. It doesn't get taxed by stuff like Esper Sentinel or Thalia, which is really nice. Um, but the fact that we can also play this out as a creature and deal two damage to any target means that we have removal on a stick. You know, one of the, the biggest upsides of Munitions Expert is not only is it really good removal that scales well, but we also get a creature in play as well. And the same thing with Twin Shot Sniper. If we can play this and kill a creature, we get, we get to keep the creature, like the 2-3 body with reach, which is actually relevant at the moment because of deck like Phoenix, it's a really good blocker there. But the fact that we can take out a creature and keep a creature on the battlefield afterwards as well is really nice. And the other thing that's really nice about this, as opposed to another cards, you know, the the old uh, Goblins deck might run a card like Gem Palm Incinerator, which kind of works similar, but is is typically worse because it's not very good in the early game. You know, you need to get multiple Goblins into play, and Goblins typically had a curve that was more skewed towards the three drop slot. But the really nice thing with Twinshot Sniper as opposed to Incinerator is if we hit it off Muxus, we still get the 2 damage. Whereas if we hit Gem Palm Incinerator off Muxus, we just get a 2 1 into play. So Twinshot Sniper is nice at just giving the deck extra removal. But it also pairs nicely with our sacrifice plan because this can go face as well. So in conjunction with Slingang Lieutenant and Pashlik Mons, we can just choose to do the 2 damage directly to the opponent, which can often mean that we can just drain them out pretty easily. So, as you can see, we've got really nice interaction in the deck, and because we have a lot of sacrifice synergies, it also means that the opponent's removal is less profitable as well, because we can just sacrifice our goblins in response to dodge their removal. 
So we'll have a look at the other cards in the deck. Uh, first of all, Skirk Prospector. Already talked about how it's nice with Pashlik Mons, but this is just one of the most important cards in the deck. First of all, because it allows us to ramp into Muxus really quickly. We can get Muxus down on turn 3 with this deck if we go Prospector into Wily Goblin into Muxus. So being able to ramp into Muxus before turn 6 is really important. And with... Uh, Prospector, like I said we can do it on turn 3, but it's very common to get a, a Muxus down on turn 4, uh, even without the Wily Goblin. Uh, second of all, the deck is just very mana intensive anyway. We have a lot of mana sinks in the deck, whether it's you know stuff like Twin Shot Sniper, Pashlik Mons, playing uh, Goblins off the top with Snoop, so having access to sacrifice our 1-1 one -one Goblins, or Goblins that aren't as important, just to provide us a bit of extra mana is really nice. And additionally, the fact that we can just sacrifice our goblins at instant speed can also be beneficial against certain removal as well. Like if the opponent's playing something like a lightning helix or a bone crusher giant, sacrificing our goblins in response to their removal means that they don't gain the three life off the helix, and the bone crusher giant will just go immediately to the graveyard because it fizzles because we sacrifice the goblin. So Prospector is just really nice at being able to ramp into Muxus. Really nice with Pashlik Mons at being able to just use it as essentially like a Mayhem Devil style effect and just in general the deck is very mana hungry so Prospect is great there as well. And then we've got 4 Conspicuous Snoop. This is just insane card advantage in this deck. Being able to play Goblins off the top just means that you'll run away with the game which is especially good in the grindy matchups like against the Rakdos decks or against Control this is particularly good. But even in any matchup just being able to generate this much card advantage is really nice. Um, then we've got 4 copies of Wily Goblin uh, so 2 mana 1-1 one, one and creates a treasure when it enters the battlefield. So same s sort of thing as with Prospector. This is great at being able to ramp into Muxus, but also just great at generating the treasure to be able to provide more mana for this deck. Um, you know, it allows us to do plays like on turn 3 we can go Wily Goblin, create a treasure into Munitions Expert just to get an extra goblin onto the battlefield so the Expert can kill a slightly bigger creature. So, like I said, this deck is very mana intensive, so any way we have of creating treasure tokens or just producing extra mana is really useful. Uh, then Fable of the Mirror Breaker. So this is the biggest pickup for goblins that you could get. This card has improved the archetype so much and is, is like the perfect card for this deck. So, it's a 3 mana saga, and on the first chapter you get a 2-2 goblin shaman, and whenever it attacks it creates a treasure token. So first of all, the 2-2 itself is a goblin, so it synergizes with all of other our synergies. We can sacrifice it to Sling Only Tenant and Pashlik Mons, for example. Uh, the fact this creates a treasure token when it attacks is so good as well, because, like I said, with Prospector again, helps us ramp into Muxus. Having extra mana in this deck is just always going to be useful as well, so that's really great. The second chapter on this is so important for a couple of reasons. So first of all, the old school goblins deck that was running Muxus, I played that so much and came to the conclusion that the deck needed to be running 26 lands, because that was a deck where if you missed your land drops, you basically just lost to yourself, regardless of what your deck's do, uh, regardless of what the opponent's doing, sorry. Um, and it had a lot of ways to mitigate Flood as well, and that's the same thing with this deck. However, the problem with running a high land count is obviously you're more likely to Flood out, and the format has sped up a lot since those Goblins decks were good, so it's a lot more punishing if you do Flood out. And second of all, if you're running a higher land count, that means that you're running either less Goblins for Muxus, or there are less slots in your deck for non-creature spells, because the thing is with Muxus is you need to keep your Goblin count pretty high for it to be good. Because, like I said, the strength of playing a Goblins deck is you have access to this kind of one-card combo. And if you if you don't run a high enough Goblin count, then Muxus doesn't feel like a combo anymore. It just works more like a collected company style effect. Um, so, because we get the looting effect on Chapter 2 of this, it means that I think the deck can go down from 26 lands to 24 lands now. Because whenever we draw the Fable of the Mirror Breaker, we can just play it and it will help us dig for land drops. So we don't need to run as high a land count. And the second really be big benefit of having this looting style effect on Chapter 2 is it means that we don't have to play Goblin Matron anymore. So the old school Goblins deck was very reliant on Muxus and had to run Matron to tutor it up. I'm really not a big fan of Matron. I think it's just too slow right now. And... Since we have the looting effect on this, it helps us dig for Muxus, even though we don't guaranteed get it off the Matron. The amount of value we get for 3 mana, which is the same mana cost, off the Fable of the Mirror Breaker, means that I feel like we don't have to run Matron, just because the looting effect on this helps us find Muxus more consistently anyway. 
And then the third chapter, it transforms into a reflection of Kiki Jiki, which is a 2 2. And we can pay one and tap it to create a copy of a non legendary creature. And then we suck it at the beginning of the next end step. So this is really, really great with the <coughs> a lot of the cards in the deck as well. Now, unfortunately, it says non legendary, which means we can't copy Muxus. If you could copy Muxus with this, it would just be absolutely insane. But we do have some really other, well, some really nice other targets that we can copy with this. <coughs> so first of all, we can copy Munitions Expert with it, which is really powerful. Essentially, works as an instant speed removal spell every turn. Uh, second of all, we can copy Sling Gang Lieutenant. Um, which means that when the copy enters the battlefield, we get another two 1-1 one -one tokens immediately, and then we can sacrifice the copy we made to its own ability just to drain the opponent for one as well. And being able to copy Twin Shot Sniper as well is really nice. It's not as powerful as Munitions Expert as Creature Removal, but the fact that this can go face means that we can just copy it and deal two damage directly to the opponent every turn, which is really nice as well. And then additionally, you can copy stuff like Wily Goblin as well to create treasures, which is nice upside if you're in that situation. So Fable of the Mirror Breaker is just such a big upgrade to this deck and is just one of the best cards in the deck at enabling Muxus and also just giving you another option for a really strong late game if you can start copying stuff <coughs> with the reflection of Kiki Jiki as well. And then I've already talked about Sling Gang Lieutenant, Twin Shot Sniper and Muxus but these just give the deck really nice top end and you know like I said the big advantage of playing a Goblins deck with Muxus is that it gives you this one card combo that means the opponent needs to be packing stuff like Thought Seize or Counter Spells or they can just get completely run over just by a single Muxus, even if you have a completely empty board. Uh, then the last card we got in the deck is just a single copy of Soul Guide Lantern. Uh, so this is just here as Main Deck Graveyard Hate. I think Main Deck Graveyard Hate and Historic is really nice right now because a lot of the decks are interacting with the gra Graveyard and most of those decks tend to be heavier on the Graveyard Synergies Game 1. So if you can sort of get a lantern down game one against a deck like Phoenix. It's much more uh, back breaking for them than it is post board. And the reason I've gone for one of these main deck is because I wanted to run 24 lands. I felt like with Fable, 25 is kind of unnecessary now. And so there was one slot left in the deck. I didn't want to go up to four Pashlik Mons because it's legendary. So just main decking a Soul Guide Lantern just made sense. And it has been really nice. Additionally, we can cycle it away when we don't need it, which is also Another another good reason to be running 24 lands rather than 25 because it's another way that we can just dig for lands in the early game. And then the mana base itself, like I said, we can get away with 24 lands now because of Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Uh, in terms of lands themselves, we've got the 12 good uh, red-black jewel lands. Uh, 3 Den of the Bugbear has been really nice. The really great thing about Den of the Bugbear in this particular deck is that the Den itself and the tokens that it creates are also goblins, so you can often deal the final points of damage off a Sling Gang Lieutenant by animating your Den of the Bugbear, attacking to create another goblin, and then just sacking them both to the Sling Gang Lieutenant. So Den is great. I'm not running 4 copies though because tap lands can be problematic, you know, especially if it's the last land you need to play Muxus, say you have 5 mana available and you draw a den off the top, that's really brutal. But it is such an important card in the deck, especially against control. Um, and you know the fact that it creates goblins is really synergistic with the rest of the deck as well. Uh, I'm also running 4 copies of Secluded Courtyard, and this is mainly here just to enable Munitions Expert on turn 2, which is really important. You know, Since there's no uh, red-black fast land and Haunted Ridge isn't entering untapped for the first 2 turns of the game, I really wanted to ensure that we had black mana for Munitions Expert on turn 2 because being able to kill stuff like Sprite Dragon or Dragon's Rage Chandler in the early game can make a huge difference and not having the black mana to cast this on curve is really important. Um, the reason I'm not running Unclaimed Territory in addition to Secluded Courtyard is because we do have Hidetsugu Consumes all in the sideboard which does need actual black mana which these lands can't produce but Secluded Courtyard has been just really nice at enabling Munitions Expert on turn 2. Uh, and then finally just got a few mountains to round the deck out. I don't think it's worth playing any lands that don't produce red because we do have a lot of double red cards in the deck. Um, so that's the main deck. It's been performing really well and I've, I've much preferred this build to the old school goblins deck or even the um, call of the death dweller deck. I think this is a much better Muxus deck than that and I think the main draw to playing goblins is having access to this one card combo. So now onto the sideboard. Uh, starting off with three copies of Soul Guide Lantern, just for the matchups where you need additional graveyard hate, you know, Phoenix, um, Grease Fang decks. Uh, I wouldn't bring this in against food because it's very easy for them to play around just by making excess food, but this is particularly important against Phoenix. Uh, it's also very nice against the red black decks, but you do need to be 
very uh, aware <coughs> of what exactly the opponent's playing because there are a lot of different builds of the Arcanist and Red Black midrange decks around at the moment. So just be aware, game one, you know, how many Croxes they're playing, whether they're playing Arcanist. If they're playing multiple Croxes, then it's worth bringing in a few Lanterns, but there are certain Red Black decks that aren't very heavy on the graveyard, so just be aware of that when you're thinking about boarding in the Lanterns. Then we've got two copies of Chandra and two copies of Legion Warboss. This is predominantly here for the control matchup. I think Chandra is just the best card in the Goblins deck against control. Now, we do have a little bit of dissynergy with the Sling Gang Lieutenant here, but I think it's, it's worth it. This very rarely comes up. And the fact that we can ramp with this means that we can get uh, Muxus into play. And the main weakness of this deck against control is Sweepers. So Chandra just gives you a threat that can dodge sweepers and just runs away with the game and it's kind of difficult for them to interact with as well. And then Legion Warboss, I didn't want to run for Chandra because it is important to keep the goblin count in the deck pretty high for Muxus because a common play pattern against control is you commit enough stuff to the board to force them to use a sweeper and then when their shields are down you can play Muxus and if your Muxus hits aren't good that can just single handedly win you the game. So I wanted to be running uh, a goblin in the deck that was also good against control and I think Legion Warboss is just the best card for that. It just runs away with the game. Uh, I did consider Ringleader but I think the difference between 3 and 4 mana is so big that it just makes sense to play the Warboss. You know, if we're on the play we can get this underneath Archmage's Charm which is huge. So Warboss and Chandra, I've been really liking the 2 and 2 split against control. And then we've got four copies of Hidetsugu Consumes All. So this is basically exclusively for the food matchup, which is definitely one of the worst matchups game one because we can beat them, you know, it's not too, it's not impossible to beat them game one, but Meat Hook Massacre is the most brutal card against our deck because, you know, like I said, our main way of winning is draining the opponent out with stuff like Sling Gang Lieutenant and Pashlik Mons. And if they have uh, a Meat Hook Massacre in, in, in play, it kind of mitigates all of the drain that we're doing off the Sling Gang Lieutenant. Uh, but Hidetsugu Consumes All, like with all of the other decks that are running red-black, kind of flips the food matchup on its head. And I think your favoured post sideboard if you draw this card. Um, and the way it works against food is it basically just takes out all of their threats other than Trail of Crumbs and Meat Hook Massacre. Exiles their graveyard so they can't keep bringing back the familiar or they can't bring back the stuff that gets killed with Lurus later in the game. And then puts into play a threat that's really difficult for them to deal with. It has trample so they can't just block it with Cat Oven if they have that set up again later in the game. So Hidetsugu Consumes All. We're another deck that has a rough matchup against food. But since we can run Hidetsugu Consumes All it kind of flips that matchup on its head. Uh, then we've got two copies of Goblin Trash Master. So again, this is another card that's very nice against the food decks because we can use it to kill their witches ovens and we can also kill their food and treasure tokens if that comes up. This is absolutely fantastic against the affinity deck as well. If we can get this into play against affinity, we basically just win the game immediately because we can just kill everything they play for the rest of the game. Uh, and it's also important to have here to kill stuff like Graftigger's Cage or Portable Hole as well. Now thankfully because Graftigger's Cage isn't very good against Phoenix, most people are running Soul Guide Lantern instead, which means that Cage doesn't come up. But if, if you queue into someone who's playing Cage, this gives you an answer to it. And also the, the Anthem effect that this provides is also nice. I like bringing this in against a deck like Humans because it boosts the power of all of our Humans and can kill Portable Hole, which is their main interaction that they run as well. So Trash Master is nice for food, affinity, just basically any deck that we need artifact removal against. And then finally we got two copies of the Acrone War. This is here basically, well, pr predominantly here for the Auras matchup. Um, now even though our deck does have good interaction, not all of it lines up perfectly against what the Auras deck is doing. You know, having Twin Shot Sniper on turn 2 to kill a Spirit Dancer is nice, but they can often, their creature can often get so big that it can outscale stuff like Munitions Expert and Twin Shot Sniper. So having the Acrone War here just gives us a trump in that matchup. We can just steal their biggest creature, force all their Esper Sentinels and Saviors to attack, get in with their creature as well and then just finish the opponent off. And additionally it can just be nice uh, against any of the aggressive decks that are running bigger creatures as well. Uh, so that's the deck. I've been really impressed with it. It's been so much fun to play Goblins again as well. Uh, if you've got any questions at all, drop me a comment below. Uh, and now onto the gameplay. I've just got a couple matches that I played with the deck on the Arena Ladder so you guys can see it in action. So I hope you enjoy. Big up. Okay, sweet. Here we go. So going first here. Can't keep that too many lands, obviously. And yeah, this looks decent. Uh, I think we'll be putting back a land here. Um, we can use the lantern to crack to find more lands if we need. 
got decent interaction and sling going on for as well. So yeah, this looks like a reasonable start to me. Uh, Spire of Industry. Okay, so we're against Affinity here. Lead on the Ornithopter. See if they do anything else with their mana here. Looks like they got something. Just trying to think whether to play it or not. Okay, so they play the Esper Sentinel, which is good to see because that gives us a target to kill with the Munitions Expert. I'm going to flash it in here rather than the opponent's turn just to play around Metallic Rebuke. Now, Sentinel's not the best card against us because we do have very few non-creature spells in the deck, but if we were to draw Fable of the Mirror Breaker here, for example, taking out that Sentinel is actually really important. Or if we hadn't drawn that Lantern, we could have drawn Lantern, or the Singleton copy of Lantern, which uh, Sentinel would have taxed as well. Okay, so they play Ingenious Smith, see what they hit off that. Okay, they hit a portable hole, which, you know, I'm happy for them to use that on Expert for now. Oh wow, we do draw the Fable. Okay, so even though they've got portable hole, we want to get Fable down as, as soon as possible, especially because we've got Sling Gang in hand. Uh, because uh, Affinity doesn't have that many good ways of dealing with the reflection of Kiki Jiki, because most of their removal is stuff like portable hole. I don't think they're going to be running Glass Casket in the main deck, so... If we can get this to transform into Reflection, that's a pretty good way to just win the late game against Affinity. So they do use the Portable Hold to take out the token, that's kind of to be expected. Let's see what else they do here. Okay, Moon Snow Prototype. And they just pass. Okay, so they don't have access to blue mana, which is good because it means they don't have Rebuke. So what do we want to discard here? I definitely think we want to pitch one of the lands. Just trying to think whether we want to pitch the Sling Gang Lieutenant or not. I definitely think I'm going to pitch the Blood Crypt because we, we want to we want to keep. It's important to keep drawing lands here. We could pitch the Lieutenant, but I think we want a guaranteed good play for this turn. They don't have Rebuke, so we'll definitely be able to resolve it. So even if we just draw lands, we can still play the Lieutenant. Okay, Pashik Mons is a nice one. Definitely want to get if we can get both of these into play alongside reflection. We've got a really strong late game. I'm just trying to think which one we want to get in play first. I think I probably want to play Pashalik Mons first here, and then we can crack the Lantern as well because Lantern, unless they're playing Emery, which most affinity decks aren't, Lantern's not really going to get much value. And getting Pashalik Mons into play makes combat difficult for the opponent um, because if we block and the creature dies, we can start dealing one to the opponent's creatures as well. And then, yeah, like I said, we can crack the Lantern, which gives us more options for next turn. Helps us make sure that we're not missing land drops. Because if we play the Lieutenant and we miss a land drop, then having to crack the Lantern just gives us less options. Whereas doing it this way around, we'll see more cards going into next turn. Okay, so they play Khan and they make a token, which is a pretty big creature already, which is a little bit scary, but... As long as they don't find Shadow Spear, I think we're in a good spot here, because we're guaranteed to resolve the Sling Gang Lieutenant, which is going to make it really hard for the opponent to actually connect in combat with us. Okay, so land and Twin Shot Sniper, that's great. We want to keep hitting land drops till land 6, so we can cast Muxus. And like I said, I think it's going to be very difficult for them to take out the Reflection here. Um, so we'll play out the Sling Gang Lieutenant. I think because they've got Khan in play, we have to kill it now. We can't really afford to let them make another 5-5 five, five token. Or that I guess they would both be 6-6s. Six, so I think we probably have to just start cracking goblins with the Sling Gang Lieutenant to take out the Khan here, which is a little bit annoying because it means we'll have less stuff to block with next turn. But, like I said, I don't think we can afford to let them uh, make another token. And I don't think it's worth letting Khan live at one loyalty because then it will just start getting them cards. So we'll sacrifice the two goblins here. I don't think we want to sacrifice Pashlik Mons because that's a really important part of our game plan here. I'm just trying to think which out of the Sling Gang Lieutenant or Munitions Expert is better to copy off Reflection. I think Reflection is likely to survive next turn. Now, Munitions Expert is nice to copy with Reflection as removal, but I think Sling Gang Lieutenant is the more appealing target to copy on this board because, you know, repeatable removal off the Expert is nice, but copying Sling Gang Lieutenant actually enables us to close out the game here. If we can copy Sling Gang Lieutenant, we get an extra two tokens and we can start just draining the opponent out with the combination of Sling Gang and Pashlik Mons. They're already down to 14, and if we can keep copying Sling Gang, Sling Gang in every turn, that's going to be really difficult for them to beat. And if they don't find Shadow Spirit, it's also going to be impossible for them to connect with these 
really big creatures next turn as well. So, looks like Reflection is going to live here, which is really good for us. So as long as we can dodge Shadow Spear, I think we're pretty good to win this game. So if another Fable is a really nice draw here, but I think I'm probably going to play the Twin Shot Sniper here just to take out the 2-2 Ingenious Smith, so that doesn't become more of a problem. And then we have less stuff that we need to chump block every turn. Yeah, I think we're in a great position now. We're going to be able to copy that Sling Young Lieutenant during the opponent's turn, get an extra three goblins into play, and then we start dealing a lot of damage. And I think we, we can also attack with the Pashlik Mons here, see if they want to block. Okay, I'm very happy for them not to block, because we will start draining them out pretty quickly from this point. You know, even even copying a single Sling Gang Lieutenant, the, copies that, like, the copy of it and the two tokens that we get is adding up to six damage because of the Sling Gang and the Pashlik Mons alone. So, yeah, I think we're in a great spot here. The only thing we're worried about, like I said, is Shadow Spear, because that can swing the, the life race. Okay, they got Nettle Cyst. I'm not bothered about that at all. Now attack. So we'll just copy the Sling Gang here, and then we can just start chump blocking and draining the opponent out. So we'll block... Okay, sound, yeah. I mean, the opponent probably should have played it out to see if they drew Shadow Spear, but I think we were likely to win that. So, slowboarding here, obviously, we want Trash Master. Don't want the Lantern because we didn't see Emery. And I don't think we want anything else. I'm just trying to think what to trim. Probably a Twin Shot Sniper here because most of their creatures do outscale the two damage. You know, obviously, it's nice to take out stuff like Esper Sentinel, but they're. Um, Nettle Cyst tokens and Khan tokens are just going to be too big for the Twin Shot Sniper for the most part. Ha. Huh. This is a pretty land heavy hand, but because I'm keeping this on the back of Snoop, this is a deck where we do want a lot of lands, and I guess the nice upside of only running 24 now is if we do start with a land heavy hand, we're likely to draw non-lands out of it. So this hand is kind of being kept on the back of Snoop. If Snoop can survive, like obviously this hand is very vulnerable to a portable hole in the Snoop, but if, if the Snoop can survive, it's the best um, the best way to mitigate Flood in the whole deck. So since we've got, we, we, we obviously want a lot of lands to be able to cast Muxus if we draw it, but since we have Snoop, it does mitigate Flood quite a lot, so... Could be a greedy keep, but we'll see how it plays out. I kept a lot of hands like this with the old Goblins deck and it ended up working out, so... Okay, so opponent passes. This is almost certainly going to be a Metallic Rebuke then. So we definitely don't want to cast Snoop into a Metallic Rebuke. We'll just cast Prospector here and see if they, they counter it. Looks like I think about it. Okay, sweet. We're happy to see that. Because then it means that our Snoop is much more likely to resolve. And... You know, they might tap out here anyway to develop to the board, we'll see. Okay, so they play Nettle Cyst, so we'll we'll be able to cast Snoop here. Now, the Nettle Cyst token is only a 2-2, so if they don't play anything else, I think we have to Twin Shot Sniper here to kill it before it gets any bigger. Now, I'm just thinking... Fable is a nice draw, but like I said, being able to kill this Nettle Cyst before it gets any bigger is really important. <laughs> So we could either just channel the Sniper, which means we're being less mana efficient, or we could sack the Prospector to get the 2-3 in play, and take the Nettle Cyst out as well. I'm just trying to think whether the, that's surely probably not worth it though, because Prospector is much more val valuable than just a 2-3 reach. But I should have played the Blood Crypt tapped if we just channel here. Yeah, I think we just have to channel because the Prospector is too valuable, even going into the mid to late game. Like I said, we should have played the Blood Crypt tapped if I was going to do that play, but just played a little bit too fast. Hopefully the two damage won't end up mattering if we end up having to shock this Blood Crypt in. Pithing Needle, okay. So they're going to name Prospector here? Uh, okay, they named Sling Gang Lieutenant, sure. I guess that makes sense. And they got Khan, so they minus the Khan here. Another Fable. So I think we'll just get the Fable into play as quickly as possible here because we want it to get to Chapter 3. That'll give us a good, maybe a good way to outgrind this Khan here if possible. It's a bit annoying they do get to make another Khan token. 
Oh wow, and they got portable hull. Okay, that's pretty scary because they could force me to chump block with the prospector here. Yeah, so they'll attach the nettle cyst. I don't think there's any way we can let 12 damage through. So we have to chump block here, unfortunately. And I guess we just we just got to hope that this snoop is good when we do get it into play. I think we have to discard the fable and the land here and just hope that this snoop gets us there. Okay, let's see. Ha, land on top. That's a bit rough. So we can block the 12-12 with one of the snoops and then hope that the second one gets us there. We have seen a lot of land, so I think we're pretty likely to hit some goblins off the top here. And since they don't have the Shadow Spear, that should be good enough to get us back in the game, hopefully. Oh, wow, okay. That's, like, worst-case scenario. So now we have to block with the Snoop, and we have a land on top, so... The opponent and I both know we're going to brick for the next turn. Oh, wow, and another Khan, okay. So that, that portable, I mean, the extra Khan, I don't think we were going to beat that. Well, even if they didn't have the Khan, I think we were in a rough spot there anyway, but if they didn't have that portable hole, we could have got back into it. That was just a bit unfortunate. So Snoop didn't end up get, getting us there, but... Hmm, I'm just trying to think whether... It, maybe we should have played the Snoop before the Fable, but I feel like getting Fable into play as soon as possible is almost always the correct play, because once you can get a reflection out, there are so many good cards that just benefit from that. So Mulligan that hand, I had no lands, obviously. This hand's a keep, and I think we can get away with putting a land back here. So we'll just lead on the Blood Crypt tapped here. So out of these two drops, even though we have Muxus, I think we're more incentivized to get the Snoop into play first. Let's see what we draw. Ha, okay. I mean, Prospector kind of incentivizes getting Wily Goblin into play, but we can go Snoop this turn and then Wily Goblin into Prospector next turn, so it doesn't really make too much of a difference, I don't think. Okay, they've got a portable hole for the Snoop anyway, which is a little bit annoying, but... So I think we're interested in playing the untapped land just to get Wily Goblin and Prospector into play here. And now if they tap out, and they don't keep up Metallic Rebuke, we can cast Muxus next turn, sucking the treasure, both of our Goblins and the land. Okay, so they obviously have Metallic Rebuke here. I'm going to play Munitions Expert during my turn here because I want them to use the Metallic Rebuke. They obviously have Metallic Rebuke here, yeah. Because if we pass the opponent's turn, there is a chance, like a fairly good chance, that they might just not use the Metallic Rebuke on the Expert. You know, they might hold it up for my turn. And we want them to use their Rebuke so that we can resolve this Muxus here. Okay, so Portable Hole, presumably the Prospector, yeah. That's a little bit annoying because we now we need to draw a land to be able to cast the Muxus. Um... Twin shot sniper off the top is nice because we can kill the sentinel here. Okay, nice. I'm very happy to see that actually because now the opponent needs to draw an their third rebuke before we draw our next land. Which, you know, it could happen but it's really unlikely. So I think this Muxus is pretty likely to resolve now. Okay, slinging off the top. Obviously we'd have preferred to see a land there but slinging is a pretty good... If we're not going to draw a land, that's one of the best cards we can hit there, I think. And the re the reason I didn't sack the Prospector uh, before the Portable Hole was because we have Trash Master in the deck now, so there's a chance we might want to destroy that Portable Hole later in the game. Oh wow, they just concede, sweet. We didn't even need the Muxus in the end then. Okay, sweet, so we're going first here. And yeah, this looks pretty reasonable. Um, obviously, it's pretty important that we keep putting our land drops, but Lantern should help us do that anyway. As should Snoop, so yeah, this looks pretty decent. Got Munitions Expert as early interaction, as well as Twin Shot Sniper, so... Lead on the Lantern here, and let's just see what the opponent's on. Okay, Temple of Enlightenment, so that's probably Control, I'd imagine, then. Okay, so against control we definitely want to get Snoop in play while they don't have access to counter spells. Ha, uh, not having a land on top is pretty annoying there. But if we do have a land after the Prospector we can just crack the Lantern to get that land in hand. So we're not guaranteed to miss our third land drop here. 
So just gotta hope there's not another creature on top after the prospector. And yeah, getting Sneep into play against control is really nice. Okay, so they play a cost Lardon Val, so almost definitely control. Ha, huh, okay. So Munitions expert on top. I think we'll flash it in now. Oh well, and another creature. So we've we've got to hope that or we've really got to hope that the next card after Wily Goblin is a land. If it is, like I said, we can just crack the lands in to get the land into hand. But if we keep missing land drops against control, it could be a problem. Okay, thankfully we do. That's really important. So we definitely want to use the mountain in case we hit uh, another munitions expert on top. We want to be able to cast that. Okay, another land on top. We're pretty happy to see that. So I think we're happy to attack here. You know, they could have Shark Typhoon, but I'm happy to trade that for the Munitions Expert if they do. And it is a little bit annoying that we did stumble on mana there, because the opponent isn't on Archmage's Charm at the moment, because they played the Castle Arden Veil. They don't have triple blue. But again, with our hand, that doesn't really end up mattering, because we don't have anything super impactful yet. And I think we'll just play the Wily Goblin here. Don't want to play too much other important stuff out into a wrath. Okay, so they've got a sensor, that's fine. Like, we don't really care about that Wily Goblin that much. And we'd much rather them use a sensor on that than something like a conspicuous snoop or something more impactful. Oh wow, okay, so they cy the cycle the shark to now, which probably means they were looking for lands, I'd imagine. Okay, so we've got a Fable of the Mirror Breaker on top. So we could twin shot Sniper here to kill the shark, but I think I'd rather go... Munitions Expert into Wily Goblin because next turn is their Teferi turn and I feel like it's really important to have multiple creatures into play so that we can actually attack down the Teferi because if they have Teferi they plus it and they have single target removal off the untap that can be a pretty effective way for them to protect the Teferi so if we just have the Twin Shot Sniper there it's much easier for them to protect Teferi with in, uh, like single target removal. Okay, so they shock in the land. Okay, and no Teferi so far, which is good to see. I mean, we do have exactly enough power to kill Teferi if they did play it. But like I said, if they have like Fateful Absence or March of Otherworldly Light or something. Okay, so they do play Teferi, so I'm pretty happy that we put two creatures into play there. And the other upside of playing Wily Goblin is we now have access to five mana going into this turn if that is relevant, you know. Okay, so I think we'll attack first here. I've got to assume they have some kind of single target removal for them to play to ferry that turn. Or I guess maybe they just didn't have anything else that impactful, maybe. I don't know. So let's see. They've obviously got something here, because they're thinking about it. So if they have much of otherworldly light, they do have to exile a card at least, because all of our creatures are at least two drops. I assume if they're going to use March, they definitely use it to take out the Snoop here. Because they can pay two mana and exile a white card to exile the Snoop with March of Otherworldly Light. Oh wow. They don't have anything. Okay, sweet. So we get to take down to very straight away, which is great. Then we'll play the Fable. Okay, Veto, sure. So I think I'm happy playing the Prospector out here. That might be a little bit greedy, but I feel like at this point in the game, especially now they've got Castle Arden Veil in play, and I'm pretty sure if they had a Sweeper they would have played it last turn. So I'm pretty confident they don't have a Sweeper, so we want to apply as much pressure as possible and make ourselves less vulnerable to single target removal. And we also have this Snoop in hand to... Uh, come back from a sweeper as well. Okay, Slinging Lieutenant on top is great because we very likely win if this resolves now. Because we can attack for what, six? And then we can sack our whole board to just kill them. Now I'm happy to play this Slingang pre-combat because if we just attack here we wouldn't want to attack with this Snoop anyway because of Shark Typhoon. So if we play the Slingang Lieutenant out first if they ever can spell, they're kind of forced to use it here, and then we kind of get to attack freely with everything, because now they don't have the mana to Shark Typhoon anymore. Okay, so we'll attack in here. I 
if they don't use anything, this should put them down to four. I think. Okay, looks like they're thinking about something. Okay, so they do use much of the worldly light. Didn't get what did they exile? Okay, so they exiled Fateful Absence, which is good, you know, that's another single target removal they don't have access to. We might as well just sack the Snoop just to float a mana in case that comes up. I don't think it will. And we get to put them down to six here. I'm not gonna play out the Snoop in case they do draw a sweeper here. I'm gonna hold on to that for next turn. Oh wow, Dream Trawler. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Oh my okay, I wish I'd played the Snoop now because we're one short of lethal. We can attack with everything, sack whatever they block with the Dream Trawler so they don't get lifelink. That'll put them down to three, and then we have two damage off the Twin Shot Sniper. So if we'd played that Snoop last turn, we could have won here. But I wasn't expecting Dream Trawler at all, and the risk of losing to a sweep at that point was really high. So I would have probably made the same play if I'd had that knowledge. You know, if I'd known they are playing Dream Trawler, then I would have probably played the Snoop last turn, but that's not really a common played, uh, commonly played card. So I think I'm going to play the Snoop here first, just because we could still win if we hit something like a Slingang Lieutenant off the top. Unfortunately, we don't. Now, there is something to be said about keeping back the Prospector here, um, so that we can continue to attack in and sacrifice whatever they block with the Dream Trawler, but I imagine they'll start attacking with the Dream Trawler next turn, so they won't have it back to block anyway, so I feel like just to get an extra point of damage in, this is probably the right play. Okay, so they do block, we can just suck the Prospector, put him down to three, and yeah, one away from lethal, that's brutal. But again, I you know, Dream Trawler really isn't a commonly played card, and I think playing out Snoop into a potential sweeper there would have given us no way to recover anyway, so... Even though that could have won us the game, I still think it was probably the correct play with the knowledge that we had. Okay, so they attack with the Dream Trawler, so we've still got a chance here. Snoop especially is really is really key right now. Ha, okay. We really wanted to see some goblins on the top there. So, thankfully they can't activate their um, their man land here, or their creature land. They can activate the Castle Arden Veil, but if we can connect with everything here, we can deal lethal. Ah, oh, wow, they have Wandering Emperor, okay. So this is definitely starting to slip away from us now. And they get to kill the Snoop as well, yeah. If they didn't have Wandering Emperor there and we connected, we could have we would have put them down to two, and then we had the Twin Shot Sniper, which we could use for the channel ability for uncounterable. Now... I think it's important for us to kill the Wandering Emperor here, because we don't want them to create another 1-1, one, one, so we'll take out the Wandering Emperor with the Twin Shot Sniper, but yeah, I think this is starting to slip away from us now. That Snoop was really important, and we're going to have to block with the Twin Shot Sniper at some point. We're not going to be able to play off the top with Snoop anymore, so yeah, this is, this is looking a little rough. Still got a chance though, you know, we could still always draw Marxists, they might not have a counter spell, like they're still quite low on resources. So we'll play the Fable here, and I mean unfortunately I don't think we can attack this turn because of their Hall of Storm Giants. And I think we need to block with the Twin Shot Sniper here anyway, because if we don't block they'll put us down to three. And then any removal spell for the Twin Shot Sniper will just put us dead on board. So I think we have to block with the Twin Shot Sniper here, unfortunately. And yeah, I think it's getting to the point where we just need Muxus now. Muxus is basically the only card that gets us back into this game. But we were so close. Last turn and the turn before, we were so close to winning. So blocking us... Blocking here does buy us another turn to find the Muxus, and we do get one loot off this Fable of the Mirror Breaker as well. Oh wow, it's a fairy, okay. So yeah, we, we have like one turn to draw this Muxus, I think. I've got to assume they drew that fairy off the Dream Trawler, because otherwise they probably would have played it 
pre-combat to buff the Dream Trawler's power off the plus one. But yeah, this is definitely slipping away even further now. Okay, so we can loot this land away. We really need to see Marxist. Okay, I mean, if we're not going to hit Pash uh, Marxist, Pashlik Mons is reasonable, but I, I still don't think it's going to be enough here. I mean, it could be nice if we drew Muxus next turn to have a Pashlik Mons already in play, and I think drawing that Pashlik Mons kind of guarantees that we can kill Teferi here now as well, which is important, but... Because if they have Teferi in play, I think the chances of them being able to... Oh, wow, well, okay. Yeah, the chances of them being able to make Dream Trawler lethal next turn by plusing Teferi and then drawing off like an Archmage's Charm is a lot higher, but now they have Wandering Emperor as well, it's going to be tough. I mean, I think we can still kill the Teferi even through the Wandering Emperor because of the Pashlik Mons, the one damage, but... Yeah, this isn't looking good. Okay, so they block... Just trying to think if activating Pashlik Mons now does anything beneficial for us. Probably not, right? I think we just let this through. Teferi takes three damage down to two, and then we get to deal two points of damage with the Pashlik Mons. So we can take out the Teferi here. Unfortunately, we're one mana short of taking out the Wandering Emperor as well. We would need, like, we could have activated Pashlik Mons twice if we had one more mana to take out the Wandering Emperor, but unfortunately, we only have seven mana here, so we just got to pass. I mean, we can still win with Marxist. That's that's the that's what I'm still playing for, you know. Marxist off the top into multiple sling gang lieutenants can deal over 20 damage in one go, and they've only got two cards in hand, so they might not have Archmage's Charm. So we go down to three here, unless they have anything else. Like if they have something that can draw them cards, we might take more, but... Okay, so we go down to three. And again, we still could draw Muxus here. Okay, nice. I mean, if they, if they hit Counterspell off this, I'm just going to concede. Because Muxus is basically our only way of winning from here. Shark, okay, I mean... That's almost certainly good enough. Again, we we just need Muxus here, basically. So we can activate the Pashlik Mons, which can take out the Wandering Emperor. Which is step one, I guess. But yeah, we, we just need Muxus off the top and then not to have a counter spell. Ha. Huh. So I don't think that'll be good enough, but I'm just trying to think if there's any way that we can kill Dream Trawler here with Pashlik Mons. If we had a Prospector, then we could actually do it, I think. So, I mean, I think we'll just attack the Narset and see what they do, but if they just let the Narset die, yeah, we just... There's no way we can win here, unfortunately. <laughs> Such violence is upsetting. I don't think... No, okay, I'm just going to concede. Yeah, so that was rough. We we were so close to winning at multiple spots during that game. Dream Troll just got us. So here, this is a war boss matchup for sure. We don't need Lantern because they're not using the graveyard. And I think we'll just trim... Expert... Probably... Pashlik Mons and the Twin Shot Sniper as well, I think is probably my next choice for a cut, but just trying to think whether I want to trim more Munitions Experts. I mean, Munitions Expert was a card that I wasn't very high on against Control, but now they're running Wandering Emperor as well as Shark Typhoon as ways to make tokens. I think Munitions Expert is actually pretty reasonable, because a lot of the time the Control decks will kind of rely on the Wandering Emperor to ambush you in combat with the 2-2. And so being able to flash in the Expert to kill that and still get in for damage, or being able to just kill the Wandering Emperor at instant speed is pretty nice. 
So I'm, I'm more high on munitions expert against control now than I used to be, which is why I'm not cutting more copies of it. So we'll go first here, and yeah, this looks pretty reasonable. Getting to play Fable on turn 3 has got to be good against control. Now it is a bit annoying that Munitions Expert is our only 2 drop. We could flash it in, like this is this is the reason why I didn't used to be high Munitions Expert, because, you know, you need to apply pressure against control. I mean, thankfully we drew Wily Goblin as another play to play on turn 2, but you, you don't really want to flash a Munitions Expert just as a 1-1 one -one when the opponent doesn't have anything you can kill. But against control, you do need to present some sort of clock, so... Very glad that we drew the Wily Goblin there, and Warboss is great. I was going to play Fable, but I think getting Warboss down underneath counter magic is really important here. Because the clock that Warboss presents just gets so fast if the opponent doesn't have anything. And being able to get it underneath an Archmage's Charm is really important, you know. I'd much rather resolve a Warboss than a Fable there. Okay, Snoop is a nice draw as well. I think we'll just go straight to combat here and make a token. Looks like the opponent's thinking about something. If they're thinking about killing the Warboss, surely they should have done that pre-combat? Because I'm pretty sure Arena... It used to be a problem where it would just skip straight past priority for Warboss, but I remember they changed that a while back. So now they're tapped out, we get to resolve a Fable, and I think I'm gonna shock in this land. Just because, just to give myself the option of flashing in the Munitions Expert if I need to, and my life total is not an issue against Control, so the two life off Blood Crypt is basically negligible. Okay, so they flash in the Hallowed, Hallowed Fountain. I don't think it's worth cracking this treasure just to crack the clue here, so... And I don't think it's worth flashing in the Expert yet, because it, they, you know, they, they... Shocked in that land, so they could have the Wandering Emperor. Munitions Expert it would be very good there. So out of these, I definitely want to discard the Twin Shot Sniper. I think Snoop, Sling Gang, and Munitions Expert are all good enough that I want to keep. Def like, like I said, they could have Wandering Emperor or Shark Typhoon, so I want to keep Expert in hand to deal with either of those. And Sling Gang and Snoop are both... Like, Sling Gang on this board, where we're going pretty wide already it could win the game pretty easily and okay they do have shark typhoon so we take out the shark here and yeah snoop is a really good way to come back from a board wipe as well so actually i think we might be able to deal lethal with the sling gang here hold on let me count one two five six yeah yeah sweet we've got lethal off the sling gang i think yeah we do sweet Okay, nice. That that was a lot smoother, that game. So yeah, like, as you can see, Munitions Expert is decent, but it can be also... can be annoying if it's the only 2-drop you've got, because you do need to apply pressure, like I said. So I think we're pretty happy with the deck as it is. That felt pretty good. Warboss was, was really efficient in that game. Just got to hope to do the same sort of thing now. Uh, for game 3, I mean. Okay, so obviously on the draw here, which makes it a little bit harder to rely on our 3 drops like Warboss and Fable to uh, resolve if they've got Archmage's Charm. Ah, so this is a great hand, but having two tap lands is really annoying, but basically every card in our hand is good in the matchup. You know, Prospect is nice at getting to Muxus, Snoop's great, Fable's great, Warboss is great, so we've just got to hope to draw an untapped land soon here. We'd love to draw one for turn two, but... Okay, I mean, that's fine. We just play the Prospect of this turn, then we can have an untapped land next turn. Four. Either Warboss or Fable, probably. Because we can still play around Sensor and Jewelry, jewelry Disruption with the Prospector. So we could attack with the Prospector first here. But... Hmm. I think I'm just going to play the Fable out here. While they have Archmage's Charm Mana. 
I didn't want to attack with the Prospector first because I didn't want it to just die to a Shark Typhoon. But, I mean, I guess if they tapped out for the Shark Typhoon, then we wouldn't. We would just get to resolve whatever we want main phase two anyway. But so we got to resolve the fate, but we're happy to sack the Prospector to pay for the Jari disruption there. And the reason I went for the Fable over the War Boss is because we haven't got our fourth land yet. We want to be able to dig for our fourth land off the looting effect here, especially because we have Muxus in hand. Okay, so we did hit the fourth land, but there was no guarantee that would happen. Definitely want to pitch one of the Sling Gangs, and honestly, I'm happy to pitch both of the Sling Gangs here, because I feel like this hand, we're working towards Muxus, so we want to keep hitting our land drops. We'll definitely play the land here before the War Boss to play around Sensor and Jory Disruption. And the nice thing about our situation here is if the war boss gets countered, then we still get to attack in. If it doesn't get countered, and the opponent has a Wandering Emperor or Shark Typhoon, which it looks like they do, because I think they shocked in a land last turn, because the treasure we get, or well, because we get a treasure off the 2 2 when we attack, we'll have enough mana to flash in the munitions expert if they do have a Wandering Emperor or Shark Typhoon. Okay, so war boss doesn't get countered, which is sick. And it doesn't look like they have single target removal for it either. So we create a token, we'll attack him with the tutor as well, we'll create the treasure. And even though we would, I mean ideally we'd love to save this treasure for Muxus, because ideally they would have nothing here, they're forced to sweep next turn, and then we have six mana for Muxus the following turn. Okay, they do have Wandering Emperor, and I think regardless of what they do, we have to kill the Wandering Emperor here, because they're going into the Teferi turn next turn. And it's really problematic if we give them the option to minus the Wandering Emperor uh, to make a token, and then they play Teferi, and then they plus the, the, they could have single target removal for the War Boss, and then we just can't attack the Teferi down. So I think it's really important, even though we would love to save that treasure for Muxus, I think it's really important to use the expert to take out the Emperor there. Otherwise, like I say, they can just make a token and then play Teferi and use the token to protect the Teferi. So. And at least this way, even if they play Teferi plus it and have target, uh, they have removal for the war boss. We can still, you know, we still have a couple creatures that we can attack the Teferi with. Whereas if they had the two two off the Wandering Emperor, there's just no way through that. Although I guess if we did let them minus the Wandering Emperor and play Teferi. They would have to have exactly Sensor or Jwari Disruption to stop Muxus if we still had that Treasure Spare for this turn. But if they did have Sensor or Jwari Disruption, having that Muxus countered will basically just instantly lose us the game. So I think it was definitely the safer play to take out the Wandering Emperor there. It's probably the right play as well. Because even if the opponent does have Teferi here... They would need exactly Fateful Absence on the War Boss off the untap, or exactly uh, March of Otherworldly Light to take out the War Boss as well. Whereas the other way, they have a lot more, or they have a lot of ways to play around uh, our board if we let the Wandering Emperor live. So they do have to ferry. Okay, I was kind of expecting them to minus on the War Boss there, honestly. So let's see, do they have single target removal? Okay, we draw a land, which is nice, because now we have six mana for Muxus kind of guaranteed. And I think I'm happy to lead on the Snoop here, just in case we hit another war boss off the top. And, you know, I wouldn't have played the Snoop if we hadn't drawn our sixth land, but this is the kind of spot where the opponent is going to need to tap out for a sweeper next turn or they'll just lose and when they do that'll hopefully give us a single turn window to play this Muxus I'll have a better plan next time. now obviously they could have land wrath of god and sensor or Jari disruption but that's a, that's like them needing everything okay sweet they didn't have the extra land so we get to resolve Muxus here hope for a good hit. Okay, sweet. That's that's pretty good. Now, unfortunately, we didn't hit Slingang Lieutenant, which means or, or Pashlik Mons with the Prospector would have also done it, which means we are kind of vulnerable to an extra sweeper, but I think they only just found that Wrath of God, because there are multiple previous turns where 
I feel like if they had a sweeper, they would have played it. So they would have had to draw Wrath of God into another sweeper here for them to get back into it. So I'm trying to think what they could have. If they don't have a sweeper, which I'm pretty sure they don't, because I'm like they would have just slammed a Wrath of God if they had it here. Like, there's nothing for them to really think about. If they have a Teferi, that's going to be problematic because... We have more than lethal here because of Muxus, but if they have something like a Fateful Absence for the Muxus and we go face, we don't have lethal with everything else. And if Teferi did survive, if they had one, then they could very easily find another sweeper and then we'd be out. Like, we've only got a land in hand. We don't have Den of the Bugbear, so even if we get them close to lethal, we don't have anything to follow it up with, really. If they don't have Teferi, what else could they have? They could have multiple single target removers. If they took out Muxus and Warboss, I feel like we st we still have enough stuff to win. Okay, so they do have Teferi. This puts us in a bit of a bind here, because if they don't have removal for Muxus, it's a mistake to not just go face with everything. If they do have removal for Muxus, then we don't deal lethal, and Teferi is just upticking. Oh, wow, okay. That's perfect. That's That's great, because... We can play the Sling Gang now, and they have to counter it. Because otherwise we can just sack, we can just attack and sack our board to win. And if they do counter the Sling Gang Lieutenant, we can just go face with all of our creatures. So thankfully that was a great top deck and we don't have to worry about it. But if we hadn't top decked this Sling Gang Lieutenant, it would have been de very difficult to know whether to go face with everything and rely on the Muxus surviving, or whether we attack to try and kill the Teferi. But yeah, thankfully we don't have to think about that anymore. We can just go face with everything here. Because Muxus will just get huge. Because of all the other t the goblins that we've got in play. Sweet, we got there then.